thank you, uh, Hugo, and thank you, Amit and Hugo, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Actually, Abhi asked me to underline this so that you don't confuse me with, uh, uh, with Abhi. But I guess this long name shouldn't uh, uh, be hard to distinguish. Why, why do you hide uh, your first name? Well, actually, the ID card they printed had it this way, so I thought, let me, you know, when someone comes and sees me, they should realize that I am the same person. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll use the joke the next time. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I've been working too long in sort of general secure computation, not caring about efficiency. But of late, a lot of people have made a lot of progress in constructing efficient protocols for secure computation. And this is sort of uh, joint work with me and Abhi sort of entering, for me at least, uh, into this area of thinking, not just rethinking, about uh, efficient secure computation. All right. So the clicker is working. All right. So. Um, What's the general framework for secure computation? Well, there is a first step where you compile the functionality into one of several things, Boolean circuits, arithmetic circuits, ORAM. And then there is a step two where you use a generic approach for uh, one of these uh, uh, primitives. And there's been a long line of work that has done it. And more recently, there have been more efficient approaches uh, to construct secure computation. But here, I want to sort of say that for certain specific problems, specific approaches could yield more efficient solutions. For instance, private set intersection has been extensively studied, and now we know very efficient protocols to securely compute set intersection. So what am I going to talk about today is a new sort of algorithmic approach to design secure computation protocols. And I'm going to begin with um, a beautiful work by uh, Agarwal, Mishra, and Pincus that shows how to construct a secure computation protocol for the median, uh, for computing, securely computing the median. And I should say this is uh, highly efficient and actually extremely simple to explain. So the idea here is that Alice and Bob have a set of uh, inputs. At each, so the, the protocol goes in iterations. In each iteration, Alice and Bob locally compute their median. So let's say SA is Alice's set of uh, inputs, and SB is Bob's set of inputs. They individually compute the median. And then they securely compare their medians. Okay? They check if MA is less than MB. And depending on what the result of this secure computation is, they prune their data. Now, intuitively speaking, if Alice's median among her lo local set of points is less than Bob's set, Bob's median, then the final medium will, median will not result in the top half, if ordered, in Alice's input, or the bottom half of Bob's input. So those data elements are pruned here, and then it's recursively, uh, you recursively go on into what survives. OK? So roughly, this is the idea to securely compute the median. Yes? So how do you? So, OK, you give this protocol. Is this better than generic schemes or not? When is it better? How so you... the, the thing that you need to look in this protocol is sort of the communication complexity. So the communication complexity, you should look at how many, what is the number of rounds in this protocol. If n is my data, uh, the number of data elements, then the number of iterations is log n because at each iteration you, you prune out half. So the number of rounds is log n, and the, com the computation that's done in each round is a secure computation of comparison of two elements. So if you think that L is the length of these, the, it's order L if you're just uh, worrying about semi-honest security to compute uh, the secure comparison uh, of these two data elements. So this is more efficient than generic circuit approaches, which would de definitely depend on the input size. But generic or L approach? That would still require going through every element, or at least the runtime. And the runtime for computing the median is still the same, is linear. Does this need more than the median? It all this OK, elements. so that's a good question, and that comes to my next slide. So let me walk through how this, uh, how this works, and let me answer Dan Bonet's question, too. So Alice and Bob have their set of inputs. At each iteration, they locally compute their median, they compare. And depending on the output, they're going to prune. So if uh, MA and is uh, greater than MB, then Alice prunes the, the bottom half and Bob prunes the 
the top half. And this goes iteratively until the, they survive with just one element, and then they can compute and find out what the median is. So now, is this actually secure? What is being securely computed is just the comparison, but is this secure? So I'm going to show the security in the semi-honest case, and I'm going to talk about the malicious a little later. So consider simulating Alice. What does the simulator have? The, Alice, uh, the simulator has the set of inputs, and it also has the median. Now, what does it mean that the simulator needs to um, simulate this um, this view, it essentially boils down to finding out what the result of the comparison is going to be in each iteration. If it knows the result of the comparison, you can show that you can individually simulate each of these interactions. OK? So the beautiful part here is, if I know what the final median is going to be, if I just set the Bob's value to be this median, and just repeat this computation, I would precisely get the same outputs for each of these secure comparisons. So in some sense, it does not leak any information at all. You can recreate the entire transcript just with the input and the median. And again, this is the semi-honest case. We will talk about the malicious a little later. OK, so this work is. The, the work of Agarwal, Mishra, and Pinkas, they show that using just secure comparison, they can compute the median. What more can you, com can you compute just by using the millionaire's problem? And what we show is that a host of problems can actually be solved just by using secure comparison, from convex hull, minimum spanning tree, some job scheduling problems, uh, single source, all destination shortest paths, and some uh, approximations. And if you notice, actually, uh, there is a unifying factor here. They are sort of related to Metroid and submodular optimization, with a, with a small caveat that uh, uh, I will describe later. Yes? So by the way, I, I wanted to point out that there, there are some papers by, like, uh, by uh, Michael Hicks and, and uh, Sim Rastogi that they, they can do program analysis and automate this, like, just like the median, median example you give. If you give it a program, and the program analysis tool can infer that these intermediate results are OK to release, and they will synthesize a protocol. You mean automatically check if it doesn't reveal? that you, You're saying that the program can automatically know that a simulation exists? I mean, I'm not aware of this work, but that would be my question. They, they basically do program analysis, and they use some SMT solvers to, to But when you say program analysis, do you mean the concept of information flow, where uh, this is slightly different? Information flow is not sufficient to cover this case. They need something like the limited OK, I, I'm not aware of this, but we can discuss after. OK, so these are our results. Can I ask yes? What is the single source? Who, what, how is the data distributed? So um, basically, the, the set of points is known to both of us, but the edge lengths, the, the edges and the distances, we, we share a disjoint set of edges, and uh, we have uh, the, the edge lengths are something that I know. This is only for two party. This is only for two party, for now. It's possible to extend it to a multi party, but I'm going to talk only about two party today. Are you going to talk, talk about style? malicious? A little bit, yes. So, well, actually, I'm going to talk about quite a bit. <laughs> yes. In the complex scale, the one party knows half of the points, and the other party knows half of the points? Yes. Okay. In all these cases, that's how the, the input is distributed across the two parties. OK, so what do we achieve? Uh, in essence, if I want to summarize this uh, table uh, in one line, is that we sort of achieve close to um, what would be the insecure communication complexity for each of these cases would be. Or in, in, uh, in, in other words, actually, if you see what the communication complexity that we achieve using our framework is, in all these cases, proportional actually to the output length. So for instance, take the convex hull. If O is the output size, the number of uh, uh, elements in the convex hull, our communication complexity is actually proportional to that. And uh, I mean, this is just uh, a comparison with the circuit and ORAM. And roughly, if you see, they either depend on the input size or they have some polylog factors uh, that they depend on, the communication complexity. Yes? Actually outputting, actually outputting the convex cell. I, I know that I'm ignoring some of the, the security parameter, but uh, yes, it is actually outputting the convex cell. 
Yes, I'm outputting the minimum spanning tree. The minimum, the minimum spanning tree size is exactly equal to n minus 1, where the number of vertices. So that's why it's v times l. OK. So I just wanted to say there is some related work in achieving sort of this minimum value for the convex hull using some data oblivious algorithms. The work of Epstein, Goodrich, and Tamasia, they show how to do it. And some part of this, uh, some flavor of the same result that we have for the case of minimum spanning tree and uh, single source was uh, already appeared in Brickell and Schmatikov. All right. So, what is the underlying idea that sort of captures all these algorithms? And as my title suggests, uh, it's going to be the greedy algorithms. So all of these algorithms can be solved by some greedy algorithm. So what is our uh, framework? We're going to say, suppose there is a function that can be computed that fits this framework, then we can securely compute it. So what is this framework? So first, we are going to require that there is a unique solution uh, between our set of points. This assumption can be removed using tricks that was already presented in uh, uh, Agarwal uh, et al's work. But I'm going to have this requirement that we have a unique solution. Then the second uh, property is that there is a unique order in which this output is going to be uh, presented in the greedy algorithm. So in the greedy algorithm, you, you iteratively output uh, the answer. And I, I will require that there is, uh, the order in which these elements are going to be output is unique by the greedy algorithm. So if you think of the local greedy heuristic as this function f, um, this f applied on the entire set of data points gives the first element. And then iteratively, given the previous uh, outputs, if I apply this local heuristic, I get the next greedy uh, output. And finally, I'm going to require this local updatability property. And this is sort of very specific for the two-party computation, where we require that this local greedy heuristic can actually be uh, done by using, by first locally computing the answers on these two decomposed parts, u and v, of the set of data points, and then combining them using a less than function or a comparison of the key value associated with these two things. Now, the best thing to think when I'm looking at this greedy framework is the minimum spanning tree problem. So if you all remember the greedy algorithm, it is to increasingly, uh, it is to order the edge in increasing order of weights. And then at every step, you add the next edge that does not form a cycle. Now, the local update is to find the next edge that does not form a cycle, and that can be locally computed. And then the edge weights can be compared even if the sets are decomposed. OK, so to just uh, show how we can, if a function satisfies uh, our three notions, uh, the computation, the secure computation is going to roughly follow this protocol. Alice and Bob, at each stage, are going to locally compute the next um, greedy step. They're going to find the element. Think of this as the edge, u, a, and v, b. And the keys are basically the edge weights. They're going to compare which edge is smaller. And depending on what the answer is, they're going to, the output of that iteration is actually going to be that edge. Now, this is a slight uh, distinction from the secure median problem, where the outputs were just yes or no. There was no part of the output that was revealed. But here, you actually reveal the output of the computation partially in each step. So this is. This is it. So using this, we can any function that is secure, greedy, compatible according to the three properties, we can achieve secure computation using this protocol. So first, let me just quickly argue correctness. Correctness follows because I said there is going to be a unique solution. And my uh, there is a unique order in which this is computed, and it can be decomposed to two parties. So just by the three properties, the correctness directly follows of this protocol. Because at each step, I compute the next greedy output correctly. <laughs> now, how do I achieve simulation? Now, if you recall, in the median problem, I said to simulate, I just need to know the answer of every intermediate comparison. Or of every iteration, I need to know what is the output ahead of time. Then I can just simulate it. But the point is here that the simulator gets the input and the output. Now, given the input and the output, the simulator knows what is the unique order in which it outputs. So 
it can simulate the entire interaction just with the input and output because I have this unique order property of my algorithms. Is this clear so far? Okay. So this shows that we can simulate it in the semi-honest case. Now, I just want to sort of uh, uh, tell here that what primitives in general, so I, I said all these primitives can be done here, but uh, in literature, we already have a primitive that abstracts all greedy algorithms, and those are matroids. Now, what are matroids? I'm just going to be very quick here, a very high level. Matroids is basically a set system uh, which contains a finite set S and a family of subsets, which satisfies two properties. One is the hereditary property, which says that if any set is uh, part of the family, then any subset of it is also part of the family. And the second one, which is the more crucial part of matroids, is the exchange property, which basically says that if I have two elements two sets in the family, one bigger than the other, then I can pick one element in the bigger set, add it to the smaller set, and it will still be in the family. Okay, This i is typically referred to as the set of independent sets. Now, a weighted matroid, as in the case of weighted minimum spanning tree and job scheduling, is that each of these elements of the set are also associated with some weight. And a theorem of Oxley from 92, uh, I just found this reference actually. Uh, it said that the greedy algorithm finds the maximal independent set with minimum cost. There's a greedy algorithm that, given a weighted matroid, can output the independent set with maximal weight, or even minimum weight, depending on what you want. So what is this greedy algorithm? The greedy algorithm for a set system with uh, a weight function is, first you start, you're going to grow your output. So you set your output to be empty. Then you first consider the elements of the set in increasing order of weights. This is, uh, I mean, the way to think of this is through the minimum spanning tree. So you, you arrange the elements in increasing order or decreasing order, depending on you want to find the minimum or maximum. And then you iteratively find the next element in the sequence such that A union X is still independent. In the case of minimum spanning tree, you want to find the next edge that does not form a cycle or the next edge that grows the forest. Okay, so, and finally you return A. So this is the greedy algorithm for the matroids in general, the weighted matroid uh, problem. Now, for us to adopt the matroids to our framework, we need it to be secure greedy compatible, and we can ensure this if it has unique solution and unique order, as I mentioned, and local updatability. And in the case of uh, matroids, if the weights are all distinct, then this property is satisfied. And the local updatability can be guaranteed if we can check membership in this matroid set system locally. Okay? In the case of minimum spanning tree, this is possible because we can check if it forms a cycle or not. And we can do this locally. A unique solution, even if the weights are, it doesn't mean that there is a unique solution. It is. In the case of matroids, if it's a, there is a unique solution. Okay, so the question is, okay, so far I've only talked about the semi-honest, uh, uh, honest but curious setting. What about the malicious security? And of course, we want to do this while preserving the uh, complexity. Now, Interestingly, for the median case, this is in fact possible. So let's just quickly look at the, the median example again. We said that we could simulate this in the semi-honest setting by just using the input and output. But when you move to the malicious case, you actually have to extract. When you're simulating an adversary, you need to extract the adversary's input. It's not given to you. You need to extract it. Now, it was already shown in, uh, the, uh, in the Agarwal et al. paper how to extract these inputs. So this is sort of the, the tree of all possible computations that can occur when you are simulating or when this uh, interaction proceeds. So if you look at it, let's say that Alice and Bob have eight elements each. Now, at the beginning, they compare the medians of their set, so it will be the middle element, so A4 and B4. There are two outcomes, yes and no. And then if it's yes, they prune whatever the, their respective halves, and then they consider the next uh, uh, median to compare. Now, if you look at it, you can actually, 
given the adversary, the adversary reveals the median or reveals his input if it is the output of the median at the leaf. Till then, there is no input that has been revealed. Now, what you can do is the simulator can sort of run this interaction with the, uh, with the adversary. Think of this in the comparison hybrid, where the simulator can set what the output of the comparison can be. It can actually explore this entire tree and literally find out every input of the adversary. And this idea was already demonstrated in the, in the previous work. However, it didn't handle a small case where, for instance, if an adversary aborts in the middle of a computation, then what do you do? So the idea first, you could extract all the inputs, but what if the adversary aborts here? What does this mean? It means that you cannot, you cannot hope to extract A3 and A4 because the adversary might abort at this node, and A3 and A4 are revealed only at the bottom leaf. So in some sense, this, this subtree is completely hidden. But what we show is that even in this case, we can actually uh, simulate uh, even when the, when the adversary is aborting. Uh, and the idea is actually a simple idea. What we do is that we actually repeat this value over the inputs that are missing because of the abort. And now, uh, this might be surprising, is this actually the correct input to feed to the ideal functionality to get the answer? And I'm just going to, on a high level, tell you why it is OK. It's because the median, the final median, depends on the honest party's input that's going to be revealed by the ideal functionality. And there are two cases. Either the median is going to be outside this hidden area, or it's going to say that the median is actually here. Now, I argue that if the median is outside there, it is already handled as before. But if the median is handled here, the simulator, all it has to do is it already explored this path. It can output that view where it aborts right there. And I mean, these values have so carefully been chosen that this simulation uh, will work. So actually, the secure median protocol can also be extended to the fully malicious case. Now, how about the other uh, examples that we presented in our work? We don't know in general for the general case if we can, in our framework, achieve malicious security. And I'm going to say that, well, we can simulate it if sort of the properties that held that was held for the median also applies to our case, we will be able to do it. And uh, informally speaking, the two properties are that there are only polynomially many these computational paths or partial transcripts. As I showed in the tree, it was a polynomial size tree, and everything could be explored. So you need polynomially many sort of partial transcripts. And you also need another uh, interesting property that at every intermediate iteration, the input use fed into the secure comparison has to be sort of unique up to this partial transcript. And I'm going to roughly tell you why this property is required. The point is that if there were two paths that led to accessing the same input, now the adversary could adaptively decide to abort in one of these two cases. And such a case cannot be simulated, because the adversary is aborting depending on the honest party's input. And you can never hope to achieve sort of simulation in that setting. That being said, I'm not saying that it is impossible. I just We just don't know at this point if we can extend this idea to the malicious case, unless these two properties are sort of satisfied. But the good news is that we try to achieve the next best thing, which is covert security. How much time do I have? Two minutes. Oh, OK. So I'm going to sort of quickly say this. On a high level, what is uh, covert security? Covert security requires that if the adversary cheats, he should be caught if he doesn't abort in the execution. So it's sort of just capturing the case when the adversary does not abort. You can think of it uh, uh, in a simplified manner that way. OK, so how do we? Uh, what do, what does it take to achieve covert security? First, let's just see the two problems that arise uh, when a couple of the problems that uh, arise in extending our framework to the covert setting. One is that the adversary could adaptively select inputs based on what has been partially revealed. Think of the convex hull. If some set of points have come, the next point could be adaptively decided by the adversary. We can fix that by making the adversary commit and use those inputs. So that way, we can avoid that problem. The second thing is it might fail to follow the, uh, the greedy update procedure. What it, it could consider it inputs out of order, meaning that it could skip a few uh, 
it could skip a few elements when it is uh, in successive iterations based on the partial outputs. So these are sort of broadly the two main issues in uh, achieving covert security. And our idea is to use signatures and consistency checks to, sh to ensure that the adversary does both these things. And I'm just going to give you the ideas involved in this. So we're going to have an input commitment phase where the adversary, uh, where both the parties commit to their inputs. We can use extractable inputs so that the simulator can extract the inputs during the simulation. And in addition, Alice and Bob are going to share some verification. They're going to share their verification keys to the other party. Then in the secure computation phase, it's going to be exactly as before in our original framework. And in addition, the outputs are going to be signed by both the parties. And finally, there's going to be a consistent check phase. Didn't you say that the, the uh, complexity is independent on the size of the input? Yes, but for the covert case, it's not. Um, so okay. That yes. Okay, so the consistency check phase is about showing that every input was correctly used. Now, the inputs can be used in two different ways. One, it is part of the output. An input is part of the output, for instance, in the convex hull. One of the points is in the, con in the convex hull. And the other is if an input is not, the, each party needs to show that an input is either part of the convex hull, is on the convex hull that's been output, or it's not part of the convex hull. And if we want to hope to get, uh, okay, we don't get uh, output complexity, but we, if we want to get close to input complexity, commitments won't uh, cost too much, but we sort of want to show that the consistency check for every input can be done in O1. Sort of there is an O1 witness that shows both in and uh, out of the input. And I'll just argue this for the convex hull, but there are some interesting ideas that we do for the matroids and the minimum spanning tree as well, but I just want to quickly tell you for the convex hull, uh, there's a simple idea to show why there is an order one witness. So what do we want to show? We want to show for every input commitment, prove that either the value, that point, is part of the convex hull that's been output, or we need to show that it's not part of the convex hull, that's not part of the optimal solution. Now the first part is easy because they are going to get signatures on the output that has been the, on the final output, so they can just show that they have a signature for things that are already part of the output. But for things not part of the output, I need a short witness to demonstrate that it's not part of the convex hull. And the idea is uh, simple. We know that if there is a point inside the convex hull and we need to show that this cannot be part of the convex hull, we just need to pick three points in the convex hull and show that this point it lies within the triangle of this. So that's a short witness for sh demonstrating that this point that was part of my input was not involved in the computation because it's not part of the convex hull. So in this way, we can get the consistency check. And I'm going to skip the cases for the matroids and the minimum spanning tree. And I'm just going to quickly go to the results. All right, okay. So we can show actually for the convex hull, the job scheduling and uh, the single source destination paths. Our computation is actually, we have the, the regular sec secure computation that depends on the output size, and we have the consistency checks that's just proportional to the input size. Well, I mean, I've not compared it with the others, but the others definitely de depend on the input as well as they have some polylog factors. Now, regarding communication efficient malicious security, we can rely on generic techniques like universal arguments or SNARKs, and we can actually achieve, we can port our algorithm, we can get it communication efficient, we can get it proportional to the output complexity. But however, this is going to cause some issues, it's going to increase the computational cost very high, if you're thinking about efficiency. Now, a good open problem that Yuval had suggested when I presented this uh, at a previous venue was that a concrete open problem that we can state here is can we get communication optimal malicious secure computation in the OT hybrid? And why I'm saying in the OT hybrid is I'm not gonna have any other assumptions, which means I actually don't know how to construct universal arguments and snarks in the OT hybrid. We don't know yet. So this is a good open problem to think about. Can we get communication efficient um, a malicious secure computation, even for the problems that we have mentioned here. And I'm just going to conclude. So uh, essentially, the, the general theme of, of our work here is to sort of port the paradigms that we know in algorithms to get secure computation. We want to leverage the techniques such as greedy algorithms to get efficient secure computation. And 
In our case, we used only the comparison uh, operation. Another open problem is what about other primitives? Do we have some interesting primitives for graph algorithms? And with that, I just want to say that a, a good future goal is can we get general techniques as opposed to for circuits, Turing machines, and RAMs? Can we get it for algorithmic paradigms? Let's say like uh, dynamic scheduling uh, or um, divide and conquer. Thank you.